Everybody take a good look. While this might seem like a regular paperback novel, it is in fact a fictional dumpster fire and a plague upon our youths. Welcome or welcome back. My name is Caitlin and I love to read other books. God of Malice was my smut book club book of the month and holy crap, I can confidently say this is the worst book I have ever read and I cannot wait to dish. Let me start off by saying that if you are sensitive to any content, please check the content warnings of the book before you proceed with this video. This is a seriously messed up story and there are some very heavy themes in this book. If you are at all vulnerable to being triggered right now, don't watch this. I would also be careful of your setting. This is definitely not safe for work and it should go without saying, but this review will be full of spoilers. Okay, let's get into it. God of Malice is the first book in a series called The Legacy of Gods, and while it's marketed as a dark romance, let's call it what it really is. It's a badly written horror novel. This book is blowing up on TikTok, and it is completely terrifying to me to see how many young girls on the platform are talking about how this is one of their favorite romance novels of all time. This book is written by Rena Kent, and you may ask yourself, who is Rena Kent? And then as a follow-up, why is Rena Kent? These are both valid questions, and while I can't really answer them for you, I will give you everything that I know from my very, very brief internet search for the truth. So I went to the Rena Kent website, and on the About Me section, there is a little blurb that says, who is Rena? We learn that Rena Kent is a USA Today, international and number one Amazon best-selling author of everything enemies to lovers. She spends her private days in London laughing like an evil mastermind, about adding mayhem to her expanding universe. When she's not writing, Rena travels, hikes, and spoils cats in a pure cat lady fashion. Okay, so that tells us absolutely nothing. So I went to the source of all online, hard-hitting, investigative research, read it, and this is what I found. One, some people believe that Kent is actually a bunch of ghostwriters that are all writing under this pen name, which would account for the changes in voice that we see as well as writing styles throughout her novels. Two, some people believe that Kent is actually a man writing under a female name to reach a wider audience, which would account for all the terrible decisions that the women make in these books that they would never make in real life. My personal theory is that Rena Kent is like a teenager, like 16, 17 year old who lives with her super strict religious parents and has never actually had any sexual experiences, but has just read like a lot, a lot of hardcore erotica online. Prove me wrong. Okay, I guess we'll never know. Anyway, so this book is set in the UK and it starts by following our female main character, Glendon, as she's on this cliffside, having some dark thoughts and grieving her friend who had mysteriously plunged to his death on the same cliffside not too long ago. She is tormented by what she believes Devlin's final moments were like and this fight that they seemingly got in before his death. And while she's there grieving, she almost stumbles off this cliff, but not before a hand reaches out and catches her wrist. As she turns around to see her savior, a bright pop goes off and she realizes that he's been photographing her. He doesn't immediately pull her up and so she starts to feel uneasy and asks him, hey, what are you doing? And so he tells her that he is there to photograph her final moments uh, to add to his collection, that the fault of her death would be his masterpiece. And she's like, Jesus, no, that's not what was happening tonight. That's not what I was planning on doing. Um, but he says that if you don't follow what I say, then I'll throw you off and take my picture anyway. Now, during this whole exchange, her internal monologue is so lame. She's just going on about his full lips and how handsome he is and how muscular and masculine his frame is, that he seems like a criminal, but not the petty kind, like the really bad, dark, twisty, handsome kind. Maybe I'm inarticulate, but my internal monologue would just be like, ah! So he says that if she wants to live, she has to get down on her knees and give him oral. And she initially tries to fight it, but succumbs when she realizes that he's serious it will kill her. He takes a picture of her after it's done and thanks her by name. So she's like, well, what? Who was that guy? Don't say I didn't warn you. This book is 50 shades of fucked up. So she drives away and thinks to herself, hey, maybe I should go to the police. But then she thinks, ugh, what evidence do I even have? Except for it's explicitly stated in the previous chapter that there was a lot of evidence that he just rubbed all over her face before taking that photo. So she's driving and then once she gets home, she has this moment where she's like, oh my god, 
what if he's followed me here and he's gonna hurt my family? And then in quotes, she says, I might be ready to move past what he did to me, but it's different if my loved ones are involved. The way I spit my water across the room, it's been less than 12 hours and she's already ready to move past this. I mean, who is writing this story? In what reality could a woman ever be this nonchalant about almost getting murdered and then being sexually assaulted? The way that I clutched my pearls, and this is just chapter three out of 40, okay? So buckle up. So she checks that she wasn't followed and when she feels comfortable, she goes into her garden and there's this garden gazebo where she painted these stars on it when she was like a three-year-old baby toddler. And then she looks at these stars next to hers, which were painted by her older brothers. And she's like, ugh. I just can't look at these right now. My inferiority complex is showing. So then she goes on to talk about her artistic family. Her mom, Astrid, is a super famous artist and her older brothers, who are twins, Landon and Brandon, are also amazing artists. So she feels like she is so much worse than everyone in her family and this seriously messes with her self-esteem. Also, her brothers call her Little Princess, which I hate so much. So anyway, the stars that she painted when she was three years old are a huge trigger to her, but she's already ready to move past her assault. So this is just like a taste of the main character. This is the first impression of the book that we get. So she goes to the shed and she paints this big black painting with red on it. Um, and she's depicting her assault, but her older brother comes in and is like, wow, who knew you were so talented? We have to tell the family. And so she's like, yeah, whatever. Time to go back to college to study art for this new semester. Um, but before she leaves, she gets this mysterious text from an unknown number saying that she should have died with Devlin. Okay, so we're back at school and we get introduced to a ton of characters with ridiculous names and almost little to no involvement in the plot. And I know Rita Kent is just doing this to establish people in the first novel so she can write subsequent romance novels about pairings of them in the future, but it was not well done. I'm gonna read you a list of names from this book. Glyndon, Landon, Brandon, Creighton, Remington, Killian, Gareth, Annika, Nikolai, Asher, Raina, Silver, Rye, Ronan, Devlin, Cherry, Teal. Show me a John. Give me a Sarah. This is also Wattpad. Anyway, Glyndon's back at school at her British college, REU, and on the same island, there is American University called King's U. Now, the Americans have this reputation for being thugs, for having new money and having these ties to the mafia, because of course they do. So Glyndon's walking on campus when all of a sudden she gets slammed into a wall and a hand covers her mouth, and she's terrified. She looks at her attacker and it's the same guy from the cliffs. Again, these internal monologues during these scenes just absolutely kill me. These are her thoughts when she looks into his eyes and recognizes him. These eyes that resemble the clashing of a rainy forest with the night. Girl, what? She's like, I could go to the police. And he immediately calls her bluff. And then he basically states to her that he's going to have sex with her no matter what, whether she likes it or not. And she says to him, why are you doing this to me? You have the looks to have anybody you want. My jaw is on the floor. He's too hot to be a predator. He could have anybody he wants. <laughs> So he basically says that she's his now um, for whatever reason and that she better be good because he doesn't like to resort to violence, but he will if he has to. And she's like, what? And he's like, what? And just like immediately chokes her. <laughs> but he doesn't like to resort to violence, okay? Unless he has to. This book's so dumb. Ah, this book's so bad. Okay, so then get this. Glyndon finds out who he is and you guys are gonna absolutely die. His name is Killian Carson, and he is a fourth year medical student at King's University, even though he's only 19 because he is so super smart. Listen, it's an American college, and so I imagine that it's following the American path. In America, in the States, you graduate high school when you're 18, you graduate undergrad when you're 22, and then you're a fourth year medical student when you're 26 if you get in right away. So this guy has skipped seven grades Get the fuck out of here. Also, the mantra in medicine is do no harm, and this guy is already doing so much harm. Is this the guy you want taking care of your mother's gallstones? No, I bet his bedside manner sucks. So some of these chapters are narrated by Killian because if you can't tell already, he is actually the male love interest. And I gotta say, being in this guy's head for chapters on end is a prison that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. He's so pompous and cringy. One of the first lines we get from his chapters is deep inside of me, 
lurks a serial killer with fucked up fetishes and constant demands to satiate its desires. Sometimes the urge is dull enough to ignore, but other times it gets to be so much that red becomes the only color that I see. However, I'm not low on impulse control like some other idiots. <laughs> We also immediately see that he's got daddy issues and resents his older brother, Gareth. Pathetic, neurotypical Gareth. Which is a weird insult to call somebody neurotypical and mean it in such a negative way, but it happens kind of a lot in this book. Also, is Gareth even a name? It just sounds like Garrett, but theer. Oh, Christina's is a lovely house. It's Christina. Are you stupid or are you deaf? Christina! So anyway, we find out that he really wants to see the inside of people and of animals. And when he was a kid, he cut up some mice and showed his mother, or I guess his mother found out. Um, and she took him to a psychiatrist where he was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. So now that he's an adult, he lives in this mansion at King's University um, with his besties, who were all part of the secret society, the secret gang called the Heathens. Now his brother Gareth is a heathen and his cousin Nikolai is a heathen. Nikolai is a tattooed weirdo uh, with a dick piercing and endless rage who refers to Killian at all times as Satan's heir. This is just such a lame nickname, Satan's heir. And honestly, Satan's heir is three syllables and Killian's three syllables is not shorter. It's just worse. Now there are other secret gangs called the Elites and the Serpents and they do these secret underground fight clubs that everybody in the school knows about. So Glinden's at one of these fight clubs and she's watching her cousin fight and Killian comes up to her and he's like, hey, guess what? After this match, let's go in my car, we'll go for a drive and you can S my D again. And Glinden's like, no. And then Killian's like, come on, I promise that I will bring you back and not murder you wherever we go. And in order to show you that I'll keep my word, I will purposely lose this fight against your cousin. But if you leave here, then I will beat him into a coma. So Killian loses and they go on this car ride from hell. He slips his hand up her skirt, despite her saying no several times and without any uncertainty. And he feels her hymen. So he recognizes that she's a virgin. So he says that out loud. He takes her to this lake where they look at fireflies and he promises he won't take her virginity tonight and it's supposed to be, I think, this like pseudo romantic moment, but I simply won't accept that. This whole plot is so gross. It definitely romanticizes non-consensual sex, sexual assault and control. I don't endorse it. I don't excuse it. I'm just gonna tell you the story. So Glinden's back on campus and she hears these rumors that the heathen, so the secret club that Killian is part of, are doing their secret gang initiation. It's an invite only event and it's happening that night. When Glinton asks about it to her friend, her friend tells her, I don't know what they do, but apparently it's brutal. I heard that last initiation, a pledge didn't get in and wound up driving himself off a cliff and killing himself, committing suicide after the last initiation. And Glinton's like, oh my gosh, that was my friend Devlin. I didn't even know about this initiation. I have to go and investigate what happened. So that night she receives an invitation to the heathens initiation night. And she's like, Nancy Drew Hoomst, here I come. So she goes to the heathens mansion and she gets a bunny mask to wear and a number, which her number is 69. And that is so unserious. All 90 bunnies get gathered together. And so the event is that they have to make it to a certain point on the ground and outrun the five founding leaders. If they make it to the point, they're in. If they don't make it, they get their asses beat. The rule is that if you get hit, you're out. So the five founding members made everybody sign contracts that they were okay with either being mutilated or killed if it came to it. That is crazy town banana pants. They take sorority hazing and they turn the dial from zero to Hunger Games. I just can't imagine wanting to fit in that bad. So Glinda runs away. She's trying to get to the point so she can become indoctrinated and hopefully learn about what happened to her friend Devlin. But Killian clocks her right away and he recognizes her. So he follows her down um, and then he forces her to 69 with him, which I guess is just like really shitty foreshadowing on Rena Kent's part. So after that, Killian gives her like a little like bop and she's out. Um, but only two out of the 90 bunnies actually make it to the point that they're supposed to. So I guess the five founding fathers are just like the biggest, strongest, toughest, best to ever do it boys in all of England. They're just 
out there maiming all their classmates. But one of the girls that makes it in is this blonde bombshell named Cherry, and she comes right up to Killian and kisses him full on the lips. And this is immediately after he was 69 in Glendon, by the way. And Glendon feels jealous as hell. Listen, I'm no psychiatrist, but if I was gonna diagnose her with something, it would rhyme with schmock schmum syndrome. And then Cherry says to Killian, do you honestly think you'll be able to replace me with this boring lamb? She looks as ordinary as a grandma from fairy tales and doesn't have what it takes to keep your mind and body stimulated. So don't waste your precious time on some neurotypical human who's not worthy of your attention. Seriously, who talks like this? The dialogue is bonkers. So Glendon's like, yeah, I'm gonna bounce. And Killian says to her, if you leave, I'm gonna have sex with Cherry. And Glendon's like, okay, bye. And so she goes home, but she's feeling really jealous. So to get back at him, she paints this picture of an imaginary blonde man and she posts her art on her Instagram with the caption, my type. So now we're back in Killian's point of view and he's reminiscing on this time where he overheard his dad speaking to his mom and saying that he's defective, Killian's defective, and that they only should have had Gareth, his older brother. And like, to be honest, that's messed up to hear from your parents, but his dad's not wrong. Anyway, he decides to find Glendon on campus and scare away her friends before declaring that he and Glendon are boyfriend and girlfriend now. Glendon says to him, I don't want to be your girlfriend. And Killian's like, well, that's too bad. You actually don't have a say in this. Here, I made you some lunch. Um, it's got some vegetable rice, like a little smiley made out of vegetables on it. And she's like, aww. And then as she's eating this lunch that he made her, he takes her phone and deletes that post of her art that she made. Ladies, if a guy assaults you, threatens you, threatens your family, uh, controls who you hang out with, what you eat, what you post, do not throw away your resolve for a little smiley face rice, okay? God, this book has set women's rights back 100 years. Anyway, Glyndon gets some more random, kind of vaguely threatening text from an unknown number, and she decides to go to the heathen's party that night. So she walks up to Gareth, pathetic, neurotypical Gareth, and she says to him, hey, listen, let's ally up. I want to have some information about my friend Devlin's death, and I know you want to keep Killian off your case because you hate him, he's your brother, and he's the worst, um, so I can distract him for you. And Gareth's like, okay, I'll help you figure out what happened to your dead friend, but I will use you as a weapon against Killian. And Glendon's like, well, that's not really what I said, but okay, whatever, deal. And then he leans down and he plants a little, little smooch on uh, Glendon's lips because he sees Killian walking towards them. Killian sees this and goes berserk. And so Gareth is taunting him. Killian then beats Gareth's ass. I just don't think that worked out the way he wanted it to. <laughs> So then he takes Glendon and forces her onto his bed where they have sex. And during this encounter, he realizes that he doesn't actually want Glendon dead. He doesn't want to cut her up and see her insides. Aww. So he finishes inside her without her permission and post-coital, she brings that up. And he's like, oh, it's okay, babe. I rotate through your hospital and I already looked at all of your medical records and I saw that you recently had an IUD placed. Ah, the violation of privacy. I'm calling HIPAA. Okay, time to mourn all the brain cells I lost reading this book by killing more brain cells. Actually, just lobotomize me. So anyway, these two have a super toxic connection. Glendon just kind of accepts that she's Killian's girlfriend at this point and starts to not hate it. So at one point they have this heart to heart about how he's a total psycho. And she asks him about his compulsive thoughts of killing people. And so he tells her that it's usually about 24 times a day that he has these thoughts. Um, but since he's met her, it's definitely less than 24 times a day. And she thinks that this is so touching that it brings tears to her eyes that she's making this difference in his life. Okay, so next, Glendon's older brother Landon, the evil twin, I would say, uh, who is the leader of the elites, the secret gang of the REU campus, kidnaps Killian and straight up tortures this man. Why? Because Glendon is his little princess, not Killian's. And neither of the men, actually none of the men in this book, believe that women have the right to make their own decisions. 
But don't worry, Glendon and the good twin, Brandon, come and save the day. They rescue Killian, and when he's on his sick bed, Glendon recognizes that she's got some really actually strong feelings for him. So she calls off her agreement with Gareth. Okay, so later after Killian has recovered, Glendon goes out drinking with her friend. She hasn't seen him in a long time because she's just been hanging out with Killian. And so Glendon is out drinking. She gets kind of drunk. Uh, Killian shows up and is so mad that she's drunk that he kidnaps her crusty ass and takes her on his private plane stateside to go meet his parents. So after a night of blackout drinking, she wakes up on this plane and she goes to meet his parents. And she winds up telling Gareth and his parents about what he confessed to her that he overheard as a child. And she manages to solve all the family's problems while simultaneously not being hungover. Mary Sue. So then Killian and Glendon have consensual sex in his childhood bedroom. And while they're like doing it, she's like, Ugh, I just feel like I have to sketch right now. I'm weird and I'm different. I'm not like other girls and I have to make art right this second. And he's like, yeah, sure, whatever. So she starts sketching while he's like hitting it from the back. And at the end of it, she opens her eyes and her eyes widen in surprise because she can't believe it. She just drew them having sex. How random. <sighs> but while she is at this seemingly perfect family getaway against her will, um, she gets a text from that unknown number that's been sending her like vague and mildly threatening things since the beginning of the story, and it's a video. On the video, Killian and Devlin are speaking, and it's definitely during their last initiation night because they've got the masks, and Killian tells Devlin, you should drop dead. Now when Glendon sees this, she is appalled, she's flabbergasted, and she flies back to the UK. So she's devastated. She goes back to the cliffs where she knows that Devlin died and she gets up there and who is there waiting for her? It's Devlin in the flesh, fully alive. So Devlin admits to her that he faked his own death, that he wanted to start a war between the elite, her brother Landon's group, and the heathens, Killian's group. Um, so that's why he befriended Glendon. He knew that they could use her as a pawn, that he could turn Killian onto her innocence and make him become infatuated with her. And at the same time, then Landon and Killian would start this big fight over her and have this all out brawl out between the gangs, making the serpents the strongest gang. And I have to say, these boys are really committed to their extracurriculars. Oh, also uh, Cherry is Devlin's sister and so she became a mole for him by getting into the heathens during initiation. So Devlin beats up Glendon really badly for Killian to find on the cliffs. And then Killian and Landon actually gang up together and they beat Devlin's ass. Um, but while they're doing it, Killian has these thoughts of maybe murdering him, but he realizes that he doesn't want to kill, that Glendon wouldn't want that for him. So instead he just severely maims him. <laughs> he just severely maims him. So anyway, Glendon recovers and you guys, please sit down for this part because the ending of this book is the most unhinged shit I have ever read in my entire life. Killian takes Glendon to the cliffside uh, where he first sexually assaulted her, where she thought that her friend committed suicide and where that same friend then beat her within inches of her life. And he fucking proposes to her there. And she says yes. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, you guys, if you've stayed with me through this video, we are officially trauma bonded. Please don't buy this book. Please don't marry your abusers. Thank you guys so much for watching my video. I had so much fun making it and I hope you had fun watching it. If you did, please subscribe and I will see you soon.